try to uh, create a, an experience for them in the interaction with the therapist that stabilizes their sense of who they are. So I, having just a kind of unguided conversation about her situation in life, the confusion would all start. So instead, we began to share assignments with each other, doing artwork, and I would have her read poetry to me and have her bring her guitar and sing for me. She was, got a beautiful voice and knew all kind of folk songs. And as long as our interactions were focused around very structured kind of activities like that, they could be playful, interesting, happy, funny, but she would hold on and wouldn't lose track of who she was. But as soon as we just started unguided conversation, forget about it. So for the next five or six weeks, all I did was do art with her, finger painting, regular watercolor painting, listen to, listen to her music, read her poetry, and that's all. Just hoping that at least she would then have an experience of being with someone and there would be a steadiness of which was which and who was who and that maybe something could then begin to develop on a foundation of that that would help her make a more lasting recovery. That, that was the hope. I didn't know what was coming after that, but I, I'd been taught to be like this with, with psychiatric patients that I'd worked with uh, during the years of my work in the hospital. <coughs> anyway, again, to make a long story short, after six or seven weeks of that, one fine day she came in started saying something to me that confused me terribly and led to a great struggle. This is the heart of my story. She said, she pushed away all the crayons and the watercolors and all this, and put her guitar away, and put the poetry away, and looked at me deep in the eyes and said, George? I said, yeah, I know what? Hit me. Hit me. Hit me. And my first response to that, I said, what? She repeated it. Hit me. Why do you want me to hit me? She just couldn't, no expression on her face at all. She just looked at me and said, hit me. And what happened is, her verbalizations to me became entirely just that. She wouldn't say anything but that for the rest of that session and for the, and for the a whole sequence of continuing sessions that we had, all that she would say was that. It's hard for me to explain. It's hard to believe in a way, but our, our meeting has turned into just this nightmare of where all she would be asking and saying and demanding and repeating and repeating and repeating was, hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me. So for the next 10 sessions, 20, 30, 35 sessions even over the next months, that's what it was and that's all it was. And I did not know what to say. I wanted to know why she wanted me to hit her. But when I asked her, why, why? Tell me why you're asking me to hit you. I'm not going to hit you, now tell me what it is. Hit me. Also, another weird thing is she had this weird grin on her face. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a mask-like grin. It wasn't, it wasn't a happy smile. You're like making a joke at me and you kind of laugh. And, uh, uh. Her, her eyes were like flat like here, but her mouth was curved up in this giant hit me, hit me, hit me. And I, I just didn't know what to do. And what are you going to do with that? Hit me, hit me, hit me. No matter what I said, that was it. So a typical session over the next months went like this. I would be waiting for her, dreading hearing this hit me again, because I've heard it so many times. I would hear the door open downstairs. She'd come up, and she'd stand before the door before she'd come in. And then she'd open the door, and her head would come out like this, looking at me, and she'd say, hit me. <laughs> then I'd be sitting in my chair, waiting with my knees up in front of me, and she often would come over and kneel down before me and put her elbows on my knees like this and look up with a dreamy expression and start swaying back and forth. Hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me. It was just nothing but that, you know, and you just was not, n nothing good was happening here, okay? I found out also she was saying the same thing to the people in her hospital where they were taking care of her to hit me, hit me, to all of them as well. Finally, one of them did beat the shit out of her. <laughs> so there was an aide there who finally just, bam, 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 on her chest and on her arm, and I saw the bruises. It did no, it did no good. You might think, well, all right, I'll hit you. It was still the same thing. She wouldn't tell me who it was because she wouldn't let anybody, she, she would never have gotten the guy in trouble. He should have gotten in trouble. He should have been fired for that. You don't. You don't hit people, even no matter how much they ask to be hit. <laughs> um, again, it's hard to explain this, 
But it gets to the point where you can't stand it anymore. You hear, you hear this again and again and again, and you're, you want to hit them. Yes, I'll beat the shit out of you. I understand that guy. Or how about if I just throw you out the window instead? Maybe that will help. But you can't. And my, my philosophy of clinical practice goes like this. The fact that you don't understand what's happening and how that it seems to be getting worse and you don't have any idea what to do is, is a sign that you need to do something. What is it? You need to keep on keeping on and hope and pray that somehow something changes and you get a clue as to what's really needed here. So uh, I can't do justice to this without exposing you to the dozens of sessions we had of hit me. But I tried then to say to myself this. If she wants me to hit her, there's going to be a reason. That's the phenomenological perspective right there. There is a meaning here. This is not just crazy. It sounds crazy. But crazy is a confession of our ignorance. When we say someone's crazy, we can't locate the meaning. As soon as you locate the meaning, it doesn't look so crazy. You see there's a method in the madness. There's, there's a tangible reason for whatever it is that a person is doing. So anyway, so I said to myself, well, she won't answer me. I've got to figure it out. And maybe if I could figure it out what it is, then I can ask her and maybe get somewhere with it. So I thought, well, why would a person want someone else to hit them? Well, first thing, it's punishment, punishment. So maybe she, she's feeling guilty about something and she needs to be punished. So I had to ask myself, not her, because you can't get anywhere with her. Why would a young woman, she's 19 years old, be feeling guilty about something and ask to be hit? What is it? I thought, well, maybe she, I don't know, maybe she's turned on to me sexually or something. I was really cute in those days. I'm like a broken down old piece of junk now. <laughs> These people told me so. I didn't walk around saying, how cute am I? <laughs> I, was, I was told I was very cute. So I thought, maybe she's turned on to me sexually, but has some weird moral code or something. It's horrible, sinful, whatever it is. And so I just, I just came out and asked her. I said, Anna, i got something to, a question to ask you. Is the reason you want to be hit, you're to be punished because you're feeling guilty and horrible and ashamed about something. And maybe you're feeling a real sexual attraction or something with me. Are you, are you feeling like really turned on to me? Hit me. <laughs> I got the same answer, okay? So then I thought of something else. I, you, you know, you try it out and you hope that if you're right, you get a response that guides you to the next step. But if the same response is just continues, I suggest you're on the wrong track. So I gave up on that. Then I thought, well, I know what it might be. It might be a passive to active defense mechanism reversal. She wants me to hit her. She's trying to bring my, the blows from me on her because she fears, she fears being attacked. And sometimes the fear of being passively attacked can give rise to a deliberate attempt to elicit the attack that you think is going to happen anyway. And I had learned that from one of my other patients I was seeing at the time, a multiple personality you'll hear about. I call her Jean, only a little bit right now. This was a woman I was seeing concurrently with Anna, not at the same time, but at other times during the week. And what she had done recently was come, she came into my office with a big leather belt with metal studs in it and handed it to me and then threw herself at my feet and said, beat me, beat me to death. Do the one kind thing that anyone's ever done for me. Kill me. This is what this other patient was doing. Now, not, don't, don't be thinking that every, my clinical practice is just this kind of stuff. <laughs> no, normally, it's just like goofed up people like me or like you who come in and cry and try to sort out what's happening. All right, but this, this, this is more the extreme range that I've also involved myself in. Now, with that patient, she had been beaten to an, within an inch of her life by her father with the leather belt with metal studs when she was three and four and five years old. She had massive trauma from child abuse victimization. And she was having flashbacks and enacting those flashbacks with me. So I thought Anna the same thing. So I said, Anna, are you afraid I am going to hit you? You're afraid I'm going to strike you. You think I'm going to beat the hell out of you, aren't you? You think I'm going to attack you? Her answer, hit me, hit me, hit me. I got nowhere with that. I tried a few other hypotheses. I got nowhere. I was getting really, really depressed. This has gone on now for three months. We're in about now May 1980. We started in January. This has been going on for three months now. Hit me, hit me, hit me. That's all it is. She just gets beaten up in the hospital. Nothing happens. So anyway, I finally decided to get a more desperate maneuver. I said, maybe there's something about face-to-face -face interaction with her that just does not allow her to tell me what's really going on with her. Face-to-face -face verbal conversation. So I thought, maybe we'll write notes to ourselves. So the next time she came, before she even came in and could say the dread words hit me, which was making me want to throw her out the window, I walked up to her and I put my finger on her lips and I said, hush. I was nice, but I was firm, sort of. Hush, today we're going to write. 
not talk. So she sat down. I brought out two writing pads and a couple of magic markers. I said, you write a note to me, I'll write a note back to you, but no more conversation today at all, hoping this would be different. Anybody <coughs> care to make an educated, brilliant, insightful, unbelievable <laughs> what her first words were? Shh, hit me. <laughs> this is working well, I thought to myself, you know, <laughs> this is great. So I wrote, why do you want to hit me? I didn't say it, I just <laughs> handed it back to her. She looked at that, put it aside, Hit me, handed it back again. So we went back and forth three or four or five times like this, getting absolutely nowhere. I'm just continuing to be ever more deeply depressed. But I'm not going to give up. I'll just keep on going. Got nothing better to do but write notes saying hit me and I don't whatever. Finally, I wrote a note to her saying, I don't want to hit you. She wrote back, hit me. Then I wrote the words, I do not want to cause you pain. Those were the words. She looked at that for a moment and then she took the page and she finally wrote something completely different. And I've written those words on the board. And she wrote it in little sort of unobtrusive letters up in the little corner. You could see them, but they, it wasn't like giant letters like hit me. And so it was physical pain is better than spiritual death. Those are the words. And I looked at that and a chill went through me. And I felt that we had had a breakthrough of some kind. Because I take a statement like that extremely literally and seriously. Physical pain is better than spiritual death. This is why she wants me to hit her, so she can feel the pain of my blows. And why does she want to feel the pain? Not because she's guilty of something. Not because she's afraid I'm going to hit her like her father did. He didn't hadn't hit her. It's because she feels an inner deadness at the core of her soul. She wants to feel the, the, the alive sensations of pain itself. This is actually a pretty common thing that one sees. Sometimes the word masochism is used for this. Masochism means searching for, the goal, the goal of what one is doing is to search for pain rather than pleasure, which is us unusual. We usually search for pleasure, not pain. But sometimes pain becomes the, the goal. Why does it do that? Just one second. Often, I wouldn't say always, there can be many reasons behind any particular pattern of behavior, but it often is because the sensations of pain provide an intensity of the feeling of aliveness, and they counteract a feeling of otherwise devastating deadness and numbness. That's what she was talking about. So let, let me just finish my story, and you can ask that question if you want to. It's, hold on, if you have questions in this class, just pr pretty much hold on to them and let me finish. But come up to me afterwards and talk to me about them. I love talking about questions, but if I get, cold, if I get lost in the questions, I'll lose my train of thought in the story. Anyway, um, so I've got this chill running through me. She, she's told, I feel she's opened something up to me. And I looked, at, I looked at her and I said, thank you for telling me this. And I want to tell you something. I understand what you just wrote here. And I know how terrible that feeling must be. And I was referring to the spiritual death. There's nothing worse than feeling dead inside, not just a little lifeless, absolutely, infinitely, consistently, relentlessly, just dead and numb. And anything is preferable to that. You would rather stab yourself and see the blood flow and feel the pain than to have this as the experience that you're in. And what, what happened to her face then, as I, as I talked to her, I know how terrible this is. And, no one is, and I said something further, no one has known how terrible it is for you, have they? That smile melted away. And instead, I lo look that came on her face that looked like immense despair almost resignation and despair. I didn't see a tear, but I saw extreme unhappiness. Guess how many times I heard the word hit me after that, and I have known this woman for 40 more years, zero. The whole thing changed as a result of this one little moment. And that, when you see a change like that, then you know that something important has happened, and you have to have respect for that, and then follow to the next thing that's going to come up. Now, as, as it happened, with this young woman, uh, I was getting married, and I, I had a big old two-week uh, honeymoon plan to go to Bermuda. But I just started this work. We'd only been at it a few months, and I know how tenuous the connection is at the beginning of work like this. I was really worried about leaving town, even for that short period, because she'd think I was gone forever. And you'll see when you read Rose Garden that her therapist went away for a period, and she was devastated. This is You see it all really often. And I remember talking to her psychiatrist who was taking care of her in the hospital. 
about how worried I was about my honeymoon and being away from her. She, he said, don't worry, we'll take care of her. Atwood, what's wrong with you? You've got to have a life. Have your honeymoon, for God's sake. Go, go to Bermuda. So I said, okay, I will. So I went to Bermuda, got my little motor scooter, and rode around Bermuda, came back. All right. I hate those motor scooters. If you go to, go to Bermuda, enjoy the scenery, skip the motor scooters. I almost killed myself on one. Anyway, um, I came back, and she's in the medical hospital because she's taken a coffee can lid while I was away and slashed herself horrendously badly, deep slashes all across the left side of her chest and up and down her left arm, like 60, 70 stitches necessary to close these wounds. And I thought she'd try to kill herself. I went away. She felt deserted. She's trying to kill herself. So I went and see her at the hospital. Anna, what have you done? You tried to kill yourself, didn't you? She looked at me like I was crazy. So I wasn't trying to kill myself. What are you talking about, Atwood? Call me George, not Atwood. Anyway, what are you talking about? I said, well, what did you, what did you cut yourself for? She said, oh, well, I, I lost all my feelings. She had gone numb again. She had gone dead again. And she had cut herself so she could see the bright red blood flow out of the wounds and feel the stinging sensations of the cuts. Her act of destructiveness against herself, phenomenologically understood, was the opposite of a suicide attempt. She was trying to return from death to life rather than to go from life to death. Of course, you could try to return from death to life and cut yourself so deeply you go from life to death. So it's dangerous, but it was not its meaning. So this is the phenomenological perspective again. See, we're confronted by something. This, this is the word hit me, hit me, hit me. I've told you a story of what's going on with her around that, the attempt to counteract the deadness. Th then you have the self-destructive act of the self-cutting that took place. What is its meaning? What is the experiential context? What is it like to be this person, that that's what she has to do? It's because she was in that state of deadness. And so what happened after that is we got on a better footing, and I was able to work with her very, very closely for decades and decades after that. And you will hear more stories about her as we go. Working with her, there was always something, always difficult, new impasses and misunderstandings developed, but we always got through them, and it makes a wonderful, wonderful journey to describe. But I would like to stop there today, guys. By the way, anybody who's in this class taking it under 495 or 395, come talk to me.